Hi, I'm Naya, and I'm here with the PA Voters Court Watch, and I'm here with Mr. Gregory Wire. I have Gregory Wire. I'm running for judge in Philadelphia. Well, my experience with the family courts um, was very traumatizing. Um, the judges, they fabricate the information and then they don't believe uh, what the um, the parent is saying and um, also that well, what happened to me was I came to court with the uh, with DHS and uh, child advocate and third party, which was Bethana, right. and Bethana was able to state to the judge that I was sending out threatening letters to the right. child advocate. Judge didn't even read the letter to see if it was a threatening letter because I was advocating for the safety of my children. Right. Um, so that's my experience with them and also they fabricated about when the court hearing was supposed to be they, mm -hmm. they the court hearing took place and i was sitting right out in the courtroom and they said oh we came out there and we didn't see you and i'm like i had witnesses that we were sitting here on time the whole time and um children don't know their rights when they go in front of the judge they're not familiar with how to present themselves in front of the judge and the judge mistreat them you know don't show them no kind of respect or any consideration of what they've been through how was your experience with the judge system sure well um, I'm gonna start in a little bit of a different place um, so I'm a criminal defense attorney here in Philadelphia so through being a criminal defense attorney I've, I've handled hundreds of cases over the years um, and it was really, while my wife is a social worker in the city and has a lot of experience in the family courts, my personal experience has mostly been through my own identity as a foster dad. Um, and it was my experience as a foster dad. Uh, and, and some of the things that you're saying that, that I saw, um, that was really the final catalyst for why I'm running for judge in Philadelphia now. Um, so that said, I, I'm sorry for what you went through. And I, and I think that there is, um, it's always a problem whenever the courts are not upholding due process. Uh, and whether we're talking about somebody's freedom in the criminal courts or we're talking about someone's parental rights in, in, in the family courts, that the people who are system involved, um, they need to know that whatever happens, that they were heard, um, that the judge cared, that there was a, a level of fundamental fairness. Uh, and it sounds like in your own experience that you felt like you were deprived of that. Um, and, and again, I don't, I'm going to take your, your word for it, I, I, well, I don't know what happened uh, there, and, and I, but I know from my personal experience how things can happen in court very quickly, and things get misconstrued, and if no one's advocating for you or the judge isn't being sensitive to the fact that, hey, well, what do you have to say, and instead of just making a snap judgment based on one person's representation, that there is a chance of injustice that, that shouldn't happen, uh, and, and that the um, judges uh, who are in the family court, it really is their responsibility to make sure that the role they're playing uh, is one where everyone gets to be heard and that the judge gets all the information that's out there before making a uh, rest of judgment or making a decision that may not be fair uh, based on only limited information. Right, right. So I have some questions for you. Are you ready? Sure. So are you in tune with Larry Kressner? Uh, <laughs> uh, look, it's it's funny. It's, it's a question I get often on the trail, and that's why I, I laughed. Um, I uh, I like a lot of what uh, the the new district attorney is doing, um, and you know I think we we got to a place as a society that we realized we needed to try something different, uh, and that mass incarceration wasn't working, um, disproportionate sentencing weren't working, um, not focusing on restorative justice was a big mistake. Uh, and, and we needed to stop over prosecuting petty crimes. We needed to stop just adding more and more you know, people into our local prisons. We needed to stop putting that burden on our society. Um, and we needed to start to take a more you know, holistic uh, and practical approach uh, and a more humane approach to, to helping the people that, that are system involved um, get the tools that they're going to need to, to, you know, if they are committing crimes, to stop committing crimes, to, to get job training, to get whatever they need to succeed. Uh, and if they're not committing crimes, to make sure that the system isn't, you know, out there locking people up who don't belong. 
uh, to be on the inside that are have been arrested for reasons that have nothing to do with actual illegality. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of, of, of his approach. I mean, I think we have, uh, in the last year, 1,800 less people on State Road um, than, than the year before. And I think that's a, a positive con continuation of things that had already been happening before Krasner even was elected into office. Uh, and I've also seen some of the judges that are really struggling with the new way of doing things. Um, and I, I do think it's important to get progressive-minded judges uh, in place in, in Philadelphia's criminal courts to really assist. And look, victims of crime still need their day in court too. There's, there's more of the restorative justice than just the defendants. Um, so I think fairness is, isn't always, look, the, the answer to mass incarceration isn't letting everyone go, right? Um, there needs to be a balance and there needs to be a fairness. Um, but I do think the more we can get progressive judges that understand that and understand both sides of it, uh, that are going to really bring in a, a more, uh, like a new era of justice um, into society, I think it will be really important and good for everyone. Okay. So, do you support criminal justice reform and rehabilitation of juveniles for even the most hideous crimes? I do. Uh, I, um, I, I am, I've worked very uh, closely with uh, the Youth Sentencing and Reentry Project. Okay. Uh, I'm aware of uh, some, some friends in the Juvenile Law Center. Um, you know, and I think the more that we look into, um, the more we learn, and the more about development, the more we learn about the brain of an adolescent, we can't just treat them like a mini adult. Uh, and even more so, we can't just treat them like someone who's beyond rehabilitation, who's beyond learning anything. Um, I've had the fortune over the last few months to really get to know some of the juvenile lifers who were resentenced as a result of Montgomery v. Louisiana, um, which is a Supreme Court case that made it unconstitutional to sentence a juvenile to life okay. uh, in prison without the possibility of parole. Okay. And through getting to know them, I, I, I know that society is so much better off for having these men. Um, I know more of the men. I don't know any of the women. Yeah, a lot of the juvenile lifers were, were men. Um, you know, and obviously the numbers of women being incarcerated is increasing, and that's another concern. But the, um, I've met these men, and I know society's way better off for having these men out on the street, back in their communities, uh, trying to be a force for change, as opposed to being locked up uh, in cages forever. Uh, and I think that's shown me what I need to see about when we sentence juveniles, like, look, let's get them supports. I mean, these kids that are committing these crimes, they're, they've, they've for the most part been exposed to trauma, there's a lot going on, and I think it's to be a society, we fail these kids and they're exposed to all these things and then they commit a crime and then it's like we give up on them when it's society's failure. It's like, no, let's, let's kind of work with them um, and, and try to usher in you know, more fairness in how we approach um, you know, juveniles, realizing, again, they're not many adults. There's a unique set of circumstances that are going on with juveniles that, that need to be brought to bear in every case. All right. Okay. Do you support parole for those charged with second degree murder but did not do the actual killing? And does he does you do you support stiffer sentences for child molesters and rapists? I'm a big fan I mean, if I can there are two very different questions. So um, I'm a big fan of um, you know, I, I know Representative Dawkins and, and Senator Street are doing a lot of work on the legislative side uh, to try to make sure everyone has the right to parole. That life without the possibility of parole just really doesn't make a lot of sense, especially if we look at recidivism numbers as people age. You know, crime in a lot of ways is a young person's game. So if we're locking someone up into their 70s and 80s for something they did when in their 20s and 30s, like what, what's the point? We're just wasting a lot of uh, government resources. Um, uh, you know, so I think in understanding what the possibility of parole is, the possibility of parole is not mean that someone's definitely getting out of jail at their minimum. It just means that they're going to have the ability to get before a parole board and have the parole board who's going to have a lot more information about what that person's been like during the time that they were incarcerated to make that decision, hey, should this person get out? Um, so, you know, as a judge, I have to be a judicial candidate, I should say. I, I need to be careful getting locked into a position. Um, and some of these questions are for the legislature. Uh, I am a big fan, though, of the progressive, um, you know, bills that are kind of being discussed right now to try to make sure that from the legislative standpoint that our criminal justice system reflects, um, again, more fairness and, and not just putting these bloodthirsty, onerous sentences out there uh, when really 
um, restorative justice almost demands something that, that could be a lot more lenient, right? Um, so as, what was the second question with the that? The second question, I apologize. Yeah, no doubt. Do you support stiffer sentences for child molesters and rapists? Um, I don't know what stiffer sentences means. I mean, I guess that would be subjective. Um, you know, from what I've seen in the sentencing scheme and the sentencing structures, because I don't know if you, when someone's convicted of a crime, there is a guideline sentence um, that is uh, prescribed by the, the state legislature. And, and that sentence takes into account the prior record score of any offender, um, as well as the offense gravity score. So the more serious the crime uh, calls for more serious sentences. Now those are just guidelines, and it's really up to the judge to decide how much, uh, how, how much a sentence is. And if the judge is going to go above or below the guidelines, if they're going to give a mitigated sentence or an aggravated sentence, they just have to put the reasons on the record why they felt that mitigation or aggravation was appropriate. You know, and I've seen, you know, I've handled several sex crimes cases and I've seen times where I felt the sentence was appropriate and I've seen times where I felt the, the sentence was unjustly harsh and I've felt times where I've seen that the sentence was maybe a little bit lenient. Um, and every situation is different. So I think, I, I can't wholesale say that I would support stiffer sentences. Um, I think the judges already have the tools that they need to give the sentence that they want in the area of sex crimes. Um, and then I think it's, it's really going to be you know, up to using discretion to make sure that, that whatever sentence I would give as a judge is fair and I have reasons for it and I'm not just looking to lock someone up and throw them away and I'm also being sensitive to the victim in all these cases because obviously they're very tough emotional cases to hear as a judge. Um, you know, that's almost a separate question there. I mean, there is an understanding that someone who is convicted of a sex crime, we someone who's like, convicted of a sex crime already has to, to deal with Megan's Law, sex offender probation. Um, there's already going to be an enormous um, intrusion in their life. And I'm not saying that's not justified. Um, in some cases, it's absolutely necessary and it makes sense. In some cases, though, again, it, it is a hardship and it really does uh, sh prevent people. It makes it a lot harder for someone who's convicted of such a, an offense to even after they've served their debt to society through prison to get out and actually to pick up the pieces of their life and, and move on. Um, so I think there has to be a sensitivity. Do judges have an obligation to improve public understanding of the courts? If so, hmm. how should they carry out their obligation? Um, I don't know if I would say obligation. Um, I think that's a, you know, for for every judge, you know, they, they can, there is a realm, like there's the job, right, and there's what you're doing in court. Um, and, and then there's, you know, kind of other th things that judges do. And I know several judges that are involved in mentorship programs or educational opportunities to really uh, be part of the community in a more dynamic way than just what they're doing from the bench. Uh, and those are the judges I would want to kind of, as if I were to be elected, to say, hey, let me learn more about your program and what I would want to do as a judge on the side. Um, so I don't know, I guess I don't know what that obligation would look like, right? I, I do think that a judge, you know, you're going to make a lot of tough decisions, right? It's, it's part of the job. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think that there, there will be times where it is appropriate uh, and necessary for the judge to explain why they're doing what they're doing from the bench to be more transparent but there's also the courtrooms that you know especially like in in the, the child welfare world those courtrooms are closed um, so as long as those courtrooms are closed there's almost a there's almost a requirement of the job of confidentiality so i think within the realms of the rules of the court a judge can decide you know has to you know, again, within those rules has to decide exactly what they can do and what they want to do. Um, but I, I generally I would I would agree that, you know, if if uh, you know, a judge, if someone has a, a legitimate question and that question can be answered without violating any other rules of ethics for judges or any rule of the court, I do think the judge should, you know, really try to make themselves available. Um, to answer those questions and to and to bring that level of transparency as much as they can. The, the causes of the high rates of minorities within that are system involved. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I think that's systemic. I think we're seeing the generations of 
society's systemic racism play out and you know whether we're talking underfunded schools whether we're talking lack of fair distribution of, of wealth or land or opportunity um, whether we're talking having look when you when you lock everyone up you're taking a whole generation of of competent men out of society that that are no longer there to, to parent and women out of society too you're creating trauma you're creating um, distrust in the system. You're creating distrust between, you know, the the people that are out there to they're supposed to serve and protect, and and the youth in, in those societies. Um, so I think there's a lot of really intertwined and complicated reasons how we got into the mess that is, you know, mass incarceration and, and imbalanced policing in, in the black and brown communities um, in the city. And I think that, you know, as a judge. You know, in a, a a city like Philadelphia, which has more people of, of black and brown um, heritage and, and ethnicity than than the white people, understanding the racial bias um, dynamics as much as I can is an important part of of being fair and, and being, um, you know, making sure that every decision that is made is, is made with a restorative justice mindset is made in the context of understanding historically the racial bias that has led us to the place that we're in now, um, that even now there are some of the racial dynamics that are still happening that are, that are really uh, giving us an unfair uh, you know, um, percentage of, of people of black and brown you know, heritage and ethnicity in the courtrooms. Um, so you know, I think the, the getting out of a problem that was built up over generations uh, obviously can't happen overnight. Um, but I do think the judges can play a big role in that. Um, and again, unfortunately as a judge, my the role I can play is going to be limited. It's limited mostly on a case-by-case -case basis and how I use my discretion and how I really get to know every situation um, to the best of my abilities to make the most fair ruling that I can. Um, addressing those things on a bigger level really will come you know, all, all the people on the ballot in May are going to matter, from the city council, you know, on up. Uh, and I think as we look at who we're electing in the positions um, to represent us, both on a local level, the state level, the national level, getting people that care about these issues, that are going to channel resources and channel um, money and channel attention and expertise to these areas to try to get society back to a, you know, not back to, get society to the equitable place that it really needs to be for all people and recognizing the dignity of, of all people. Okay. So I thank you for your questions. Is there anything else you would like to tell people? And I would like to just, um, so one of our main focus is to get more people into judicial elections, but also to look for people that are helping to make the courts accountable and transparent. Is that something that you can help us do as just citizens, not just our organizations, right. but as citizens wanting to see accountable and transparent courtrooms? Yeah, look, I, as I as I said uh, to Naya, right? Sorry, uh, said so to Naya. I mean, I think you know, within the whatever can be done within the confines of judicial ethics uh, and and within the, the rules of the court. Um, yes, I, I think I can. I can. I think there will be an opportunity to bring about more transparency. Um, what that could look like, you know, I I want to know at this point, right? <laughs> I'm just a guy trying to win an election right now. Um, but I, I do think that it's, it's a conversation I'd be happy to engage um, and you know, happy to, uh, to, to sit down and, and, and hash out some ideas of how to you know, make sure that people know in this city that the court system is, is there to serve the people. Um, you know, I think too often you know, I see very smart people in the law that have this mentality almost that people should serve the law. And it's really supposed to be the other way around. If the law is not serving the people, then what is it serving? Um, and I think that um, if you're bringing that, that mentality of, hey, that the law needs to serve the people, I think that does inform how I would want to be available and be transparent and, and answer any tough questions that might come my way um, you know, over the course of my career as a judge if I get the opportunity. And just to piggyback on what Naya said, she said she was a bit mistreated in the courtroom. As a judge, if you see that going on in your courtroom, like the, the clients aren't being right. treated or represented right, how would you address that? I think that there are ways. I mean, every case is different. Um, if this really was a situation where um, it seemed like certain professionals were, were 
uh, you know, uh, throwing somebody else under the bus, and it didn't seem like she had her full chance to be heard herself. Uh, there's a couple of things you could do. You could say, look, are there letters? I haven't read them. Let's come back in two weeks. I really want to take another look at this. I want to, let's make sure I have all the facts before I rush to judgment and take someone's word on something. If they're saying they're threatening letters. You're saying they're not. Well, I might have 12 other cases to do in the next hour, but this is important. I want to get this right. All right, let's make sure I do that. And if I can't do that that moment, let's come back in, in, in two weeks. Um, you know, so I, I'm trying to think of any other context. I mean, where that kind of thing might come up where there's a where someone is getting mistreated other than where it's like all right i'm getting conflicting stories here especially when there's documentary evidence <laughs> let's let's get the documents and let's read them and let's look at what's going on um but sometimes you might not have documents so it's like all right well look i'm gonna put you on the stand or i'm gonna ask you questions um and if you're not represented do you want to bring a lawyer in to represent you so we can really make sure that that no matter what happens that that your side of the story was put out there and then it's going to be up to the judge to make the determination of like well all right who's who's more credible who do i believe who might just have done their job really badly and is now trying to you know cover their own you know behind uh, which i think you'll see in the family Bye. courts um and then just being aware and look i i have my own personal experiences like i've seen i've seen some things some things happen and and um so i think i, I would have a, a greater sensitivity to that um you know, than, than some of the other candidates that don't really know what happens in those courtrooms on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's some that, some there's not all of them. Some very much are, are well aware of what happens in there. Um, so, but I, I would hope to be one of the judges that would be able to bring my personal experience to bear um, as I, I make rulings um, that, that are ultimately, you know, fairer and, and more full of, uh, you know, justice for everyone involved in the situation. That's important to a lot of our families because a lot of them go in the courtroom and these judges, I mean, these attorneys are just as bad and don't really represent the family well. Like, they, they're, like they're working with DHS to throw the family under the bus. So that was very important and I really, I really connected with your response. Is there anything else you would like to say to us um, um, why we should support you? Um, yeah, like, uh, for, for me, I, look, that one thing that I probably should say is when you're elected as a judge, you don't have a choice what kind of courtroom you end up in. Um, so it's really the administrative judges will assign uh, elected judges to a courtroom, whether that's criminal court, family court, juvenile court, or civil court. Um, as a new judge, I would likely put in one of the criminal courts or in the family courts or the juvenile court. Um, and I think that wherever I'm put, I, I do think that it's the combination of my experiences as a criminal defense attorney uh, as well as my identity as a foster dad that's that's given me something really unique and, and good and powerful that I want to bring with me to the Philadelphia bench uh, and that I, I would strive uh, to, to make it evident that I, I respect the dignity of all people in my courtroom and that uh, no matter what happens uh, in my courtroom that I will always strive to, to seek restorative justice in every case that I would I would make a decision on. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gregory. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, you can go on my website. Uh, it's gregorywire.com. It's G-R-E-G-O-R-Y-W-E-Y-E-R.com. Uh, so I have an email address on there. There's a video on there. Uh, you can check out. Uh, there's a, uh, a cell phone number. I'm not a cell phone. There's a, a number to my campaign on there as well. And also links to all my social media accounts, both uh, Instagram and Facebook. So best place to go is gregorywire.com. That's G-R-E-G-O-R-Y-W-E-Y-E-R.